you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast, the hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready, strap yourself in, keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times, because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks, Chris Voss here from the ChrisVossShow.com. The ChrisVossShow.com. Hey, we certainly appreciate you guys coming by the show. I hope you're all strapped in, as the announcer radio guy says at the beginning of the show. Uh, I don't know why you'd want to be strapped in. I can, I have this picture in my head of everyone sitting in their office chairs, not doing their work today, and they're just like putting on a seatbelt. Like, <laughs> is that a thing? They probably have those at work too, but they're probably more like the strap in at work is probably more like you're locked down to your desk. Uh, on some uh, medieval sort of uh, torture chamber and say, do your work, and your boss is whipping the chain or something. I don't know. It's a, I've created just a whole thing that, that goes on. Clearly, I'm self-employed and don't go into the office. Anyway, guys, thanks for tuning in. I don't know what that ramble was about, but we improv the beginning of our show, so there you go. Have fun with that. Uh, I've just created just the imagination of horror in people's minds. Like, why did I tune in today? Hi, folks. Here's Foss here with a little station break. Hope you're enjoying the show so far. We'll resume here in a second. Uh, I'd like to invite you to come to my coaching, speaking, and training courses website. You can also see our new podcast over there at chrisvossleadershipinstitute.com. Over there, you can find all the different stuff that we do for speaking engagements, if you'd like to hire me, uh, training courses that we offer, and coaching for leadership, management, entrepreneurism, uh, podcasting, corporate stuff. Uh, with over 35 years of experience in business and running companies as a CEO, uh, I think I can offer a wonderful breadth of information information and knowledge to you or anyone that you want to invite me to for your company. Thanks for tuning in. We certainly appreciate you listening to the show and be sure to check out Chris Voss leadership Institute.com. Now back to the show. Anyway, guys, we have of course an amazing, brilliant uh, multi-book author on the show. Uh, but in the meantime, go to youtube.com for it says Chris Voss, hit the bell notification button, go to goodreads.com for it says Chris Voss. Go to all our groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, the big LinkedIn group, the LinkedIn newsletter, and all those fun places. Go to also to my uh, consulting speaking website, ChrisVossLeadershipInstitute.com. Today, our amazing author that we have on the show, uh, Nan Fisher, is with us today. She's a multi-book author. We'll find out how many here in a bit. Uh, she has a new book coming out, a novel on July 26, 2022. Was, it was just January yesterday. Why is it July now? Uh, I don't know. Uh, the new book is called Some of It Was Real. And uh, she's going to be talking about that book and everything that goes into the book and uh, what she what her thoughts are. And we're going to be talking about uh, what we should be doing to read that book. So uh, let's get into her bio here, which I have uh, lost. And she is the author of Some of It Was Real uh, by Berkeley Publishing, coming out July 2022, and the young adult novels When Elephants Fly and The Speed of Falling Objects. Additionally, author credits include Junior Jedi Knights from the Star Wars uh, series there, a middle-grade Star Wars trilogy for Lucasfilm, and she co-authored sports autobiographies for elite athletes, including number one-ranked tennis superstar Monica Sellas, and a triple crown race winning jockey Julie Chrome, Olympus Olympic gold medal speech medal skaters, legendary gymnastics coaches, and Olympic gold medal gymnasts. Welcome to the show, Nan. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome sauce. I'm I'm looking through your awards list here that are in that's in your bio, and it is amazing all the awards you have. You you've just killed it when it comes to doing books. How many books do you have? I have 11 out, and I think the next one, some of the, the surreal, will be my 12th. 12th. 12 books. Oh, my gosh. That's awesome sauce. So uh, give us your dot .coms, uh, wherever you want people to find you on the interwebs and get to know you better. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Nan Fisher, F-I-S-C-H-E-R, author, and nanfisherauthor.com is my website. There you go. So what motivated you want to write this book? Well, um, I am obsessed with psychics. First of all, I 
find what they do incredibly fascinating. And I've had some experiences with psychics in my life that have stayed with me. Um, I'm also interested in imposter syndrome. Do you know what that is? Yes, I do. We've had that one. Yes, it's a big one. I think we all suffer at times from a crisis of confidence. And and right now I'm having one being on your radio show. you're, You're fine. Um, and I'm also really interested in origin stories, which are the stories that we are told from our childhood, the memories we have from childhood, and sometimes even the lies we're told that we use to define who we are in life. And if your origin story is faulty, then you don't have the opportunity to live an authentic life. That's true. That's true. Uh, my, my origin story was... Uh... Let's see. I, I was born, uh, I don't know. I, I, I can't come up with anything. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to come up with some funny. It's Friday today and I didn't have a podcast. So I'm off my game yesterday. So like I get, you give me a day off and my brain goes, Woo-hoo! so, uh, give us an overall arcing story, uh, line, uh, you know, at least, uh, overall arcing of the, uh, book. Well, without giving anything away, some of it was real. It's about a psychic named Sylvie who is on the verge of stardom but is unsure of her gifts and a journalist named Thomas who has one last chance at redemption if he can prove that Sylvie's a fraud. So he sets a trap for Sylvie and she falls into it and he gives her an opportunity to prove she's the real deal uh, by spending a week with him before his expose is published where she's not allowed to research her audience members before her next show. So they play this game of cat and mouse during the week, but discover a very dark secret from Sylvie's past. And if they can figure out what that secret is, uh, they have the opportunity to live more authentically. If they can't, it may destroy their lives unless they can figure out what's real. Ah, now there's two people holding hands on the cover of the book. Is uh, Do they have a romantic relationship, those two individuals, or...? Definitely, Sylvia and Thomas definitely have a romantic relationship, but much of the book is about a game of cat and mouse where they're Uh forcing each other to question their origin stories, to face their own imposter syndrome, and to they're giving each other the opportunity to live an authentic life, whether or not they end up together in the end of the Mm. book. Do they start out together or is this something that uh, evolves in their cat and mouse? uh... They definitely don't start out together. Sylvie is fighting for her life. She's Mm -hmm. fighting for her identity because Thomas is basically trying to prove she's a fraud and ruin her career. Thomas is fighting for he's had some missteps in his journalism career. And this is his last chance with the L.A. Times to write an expose before he's going to be demoted to obituaries. Mm -hmm. And he decides he's going to basically out her in his in initially. Yes. Given his past, his mother is basically a victim of grief vampires, which is what he calls psychics because they prey on people's people's grief. And so he has skin in the game. He really wants to prove that psychics aren't real at all. Hmm. So what uh, what made you choose the structure of this? I mean, you, you mentioned earlier that you you like psychics. Do you believe in psychics or have you just kind of been always interested in them? And, or, I, um, I'm curious if you believe in psychics. Uh, there's a joke here somewhere about, uh, about I knew you'd say that, uh, or <laughs> something else. I, I, I'm not sure that I do. Let's put it that way. Um, but uh, I believe there's people in Tuna, but I, I've watched uh, a lot of different things. Penn and Teller, I think. Uh, so, so I'm not really sure, but I respect anyone's opinion if they believe in if they believe in psychics, you know, I, mean, I I have lots of friends who believe in religion too. So I'm an atheist. So you know. Right. Well, I, I don't know what I believe. And I don't think okay. that when you read this book that you need to believe in psychics. But uh, when I was in my, my early 20s, I was on a flight from Denver to Aspen. And it's called the Vomit Comet because the mountain air is really turbulent. <laughs> And so whenever I would take that flight, I would look for the barf bag in the front of my seat and I would oh. take it and then I would turn to the person next to me and I would apologize before the flight took off because I, I have a weak stomach. And so I turned to this one woman, she was this elegant gray haired lady and I apologized and she asked for my palm. 
And for the next hour, she read my poem. And at the end of the flight, it turned out she was a, a really well-known psychic who was going to a glitzy party in Aspen to read people's poems. And at the end of the flight, I asked her if I was ever going to get married. And she said, if you want it enough. And that just stuck with me throughout my entire life, because here was this famous psychic who was telling me I had control of my destiny. Yeah. And I think that's kind of the gift that some psychics can give people. They can both alleviate their grief, but they can also give them ownership of their own life. Yeah. And what she said to me changed the course of my life. You know, I, I was a ski bomb in Aspen after having worked for Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do in my life. And she made me question what I really wanted and gave me ownership of my life. And I left Aspen and I moved to San Francisco and I tried on a lot of different jobs. I was a grant writer for UCSF. I wrote Star Wars books. I wrote sport autobiographies. And, and it led me on the path to discover what I really, really wanted, which is actually where I am now, writing adult fiction. Awesome. I mean, that's it's, it's interesting, the journey that we go on in life. And that's one of the things I love about the show is, is seeing how people, you know, navigated their journey of life. Cause it's, it's a, it's a wilderness of uh, mirrors. It's a, it's an interesting thing that people go on. And, and, and I'm always curious as to why people choose what they do. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. So you spent a lot of time studying psych psychics for the book. I did. I, you know, I read a ton about psychics. I watched a lot of, um, documentaries and, um, uh, fun TV shows like Ty Tyler Henry's show. And there's a, um, a YouTube show, YouTube show called Seatbelt Psychic. Um, and what I discovered through that is whether you believe in what a psychic does or not, it doesn't really matter. Like all these people are looking for closure. They're looking to alleviate their grief. And, you know, some people do that through religion. Some people do that through adrenaline sports. Some, you know, everybody has a way to do that. But what these people provide um, is another way for people to get through and move on in their lives. So I, I started out writing this book, not knowing what I believed. And I realized by the time I'd finished that it doesn't matter what you believe. What matters is the gift that people can give other people. That's true. A lot of people, you know, a lot of people embrace a lot of things to get through life and kind of lay their, uh, you know, different fears or insecurities or, you know, and I think you're right. It helps people get empowered and stuff. Um, and so, uh, would you call this a romantic book as well? Because I mean, they, they kind of end up in a relationship together. I would call it more of a mystery with lots of twists and turns uh -huh. and a page turner. So when I was a kid, my parents, before I could read, used to read a chapter out of a Dickens novel to us every night before bed. And what people don't know about Charles Dickens is that he started by writing for newspapers and every chapter that was published was a cliffhanger so that you would buy the next newspaper. Ah. And so that's what I try and do in my writing. I, every chapter, I want people to want to turn the next page. Um, so more than anything, I would say some of it was real is a page turner with some interesting twists, but that also leaves you questioning your own origin story and realizing that even if your origin story is true, you can still be the architect of your life. You can mm. still be the hero of your life's journey and make decisions regardless of your past and what created you. Do you think it creates a good lesson for that where you, you know, you, a lot of people have, you know, weird origin stories, you know, maybe mm -hmm. their origin story is more from their ego and how what their ego maintains is their PR presence as opposed to, you know, what really happened. Like me, I was raised as a, you know, son of a, an Arabian king and, and whatever, but we all know that's BS. <laughs> uh, the, uh, but you know, I, I don't know what that, but, but, uh, do you, do you think it's a good, uh, I don't know, allegory or some sort of, uh, a good way to show people that maybe you should, maybe you should check your six on, on your own origin story? I think so. I think we go through life sometimes allowing life to happen to us. And I think that as far as I know, you only get one opportunity. Mm -hmm. So taking control of your narrative is super important. You know, I, my origin story is obviously everyone, like everyone's it's, it's 
a lot of different things. But one thing for me in my childhood was I had someone who said to me a lot, I love you, but I don't like you. And I grew up, you know, for some people that would just be a throwaway. For me, I'm a sensitive person. And like, I grew up really, truly believing I wasn't likable. Wow. And I, yeah. And at some point in my life, I just took ownership and said, that's not going to define who I am in the future. If you go through life trying to be likable, it's mm. really difficult. And I think I spent most of my 20s trying to be likable. I still want you to like me, yeah. but, um, but, it's, but it's not how I define myself. I understand that that's a belief set up that I have, and that's part of my origin story. Mm. But that happened as a child, seen through the lens of a child. And you get to decide as an adult how to look at those experiences and then how to move past them. So I guess I, I, I do hope that this novel makes people look at their own lives and, and decide who they want to be. So we're excited to announce my new book is coming out. It's called Beacons of Leadership, Inspiring Lessons of Success in Business and Innovation. It's going to be coming out on October 5th, 2021. And I'm really excited for you to get a chance to read this book. It's filled with a multitude of my insightful stories, lessons, my life, and experiences in leadership and character. I give you some of the secrets from my CEO entrepreneurial toolbox that I use to scale my business success, innovate, and build a multitude of companies. I've been a CEO for, uh, what is it, like uh, 33, 35 years now. We talk about leadership, the importance of leadership, how to become a great leader, and how anyone can become a great leader as well. Or order the book wherever fine books are sold. There you go. You know, my parents told me they liked me, but they didn't love me. And oh, well, that's even worse. Get, get the hell out of our <laughs> house as soon as possible. Right. Um, yeah, they weren't that bad. Uh, it was close, though. Um, I don't know. My dad, I don't know. Sometimes he'd look at me funny and be like, I know my mom used to say, uh, I wish I had more daughters because you boys suck. Uh, something to that effect. Uh, but uh, I couldn't blame her. We were awful children, too. So <laughs> I doubt that. We're, 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 well, we we're, were trouble. Me and my brother were trouble. <laughs> we, we, would, we, would, we would come up with stuff to drive my mom completely insane on purpose. And so, I mean, we, 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 we earned some of, the, some of the crap we got. Uh, but <laughs> I don't know. We're just boys, really. Right. That's your job, pushing yeah. the boundaries as a kid. Yeah, I mean, you got to, I mean, if there's something to do around the house, piss off mom. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's it's fun. We used to we used to play this game with mom where we would, we would she'd be in the kitchen or something cooking, and, and we would go in and start picking at her or try and figure out something to say that would set her off. And we knew there was kind of a few things that would that always set her off. And then what we would do is we'd get in a runner's kind of stance, sort of <laughs> readiness, and the game was to see how close we could get to mom, be able to piss her off to where she'd start chasing us with whatever sort of wooden handle she, spatula or whatever she had in her in her hand, and um, to see if we could get away and not get beaten. Um, and the game became, after time, uh, you know, a, a matter of distance where, okay, well, f five feet, four feet. And, and then, of course, when we, you know, lost that game, you knew that four feet was too close to piss off mom that you, you had to figure out the game was to see how how close you get to mom and still be able to outrun her without getting a severe you beating. probably got faster too i would imagine we did there was probably i mean <laughs> maybe i maybe i missed my calling as a track star or something there you go something there with your mom but uh yeah we, we, we earned it we, we were we were something else as kids um but uh back to your book uh <laughs> so <laughs> the pissing off mom your next book um yeah, how to survive anyway. Um, so a lot of psychic stuff, a uh, romantic story between the two. Um, and then uh, I guess there's probably some some real tension over the publishing of the story because uh, I mean if you're gonna if you're gonna like get romantically involved in someone, it's probably best not to be publishing stories uh, about them, right? Yes, there is a definite conflict of interest, not only with Thomas getting involved with Sylvie, but also with what Thomas believes. He's a, he's a very logical color in the lines kind of mm. person, but getting pushed by Sylvie allows him to broaden his horizons. He still may not believe, but he opens himself up to the possibilities. But yes, it provides a huge conflict of interest. 
and gives Sylvie the opportunity to kill his story. So you have to wonder, <laughs> is she really interested in him? Is she trying to create a situation where she regains hand? Um, so you have to decide as the reader what's actually real in the story. Mm. Is there any twist at the end? Yes. Ah. There is. Definite the twist. Definite twist. Okay. Yes. Well, this sounds, that, that sounds like. Have I hooked you yet? I hope so. Yeah, there, there's the, that's, <laughs> the, that's the hook, right? It just went right in and got me. Right. Um, anything more you want to tease out about the book? Was there any characters, maybe Hollywood characters you thought of as you were writing it or people in your life or yourself that you thought of when you were writing it? Well, I think all authors imagine what actors or actresses would play the parts of their characters. Um, but more than anything, I mean, I, I think I could see Zendaya as Sylvie mm -hmm. um, for sure. Um, but, you know, more than anything, I just want people to read the story and come away with the fact that it's a, my dad used to always say when he finished a book he loved, that was a great yarn well told. And that's mm -hmm. my goal is a great yarn well told, something people fly through, love reading, and that makes them think a little at the end and, and comes back to them at different times in their life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, it's always an adventure. People love these sort of books, and they love romance. They love uh, complex stories and stuff. Do you see it uh, uh, ever becoming something you see on the big screen? Or maybe well, TV? I mean, I think everyone... Everyone hopes for that. Um, and every time I write something, I see it first as kind of a movie in my mind. Um, but that's, you know, lightning in a bottle and kind of like winning the, the, the book lottery. I just want people to go out and hopefully pre-order and buy it and enjoy it and, and follow me and, and be excited to read. I have another book coming out with Berkeley, um, in August, 2023. So wow. my, my hope is that that people like what I write enough that I get to keep doing this this gig because it's really fun to sit yeah. and imagine. And do you want to know what the next one's about? Yeah, sure. Tease us out. Um, well, it's uh, it doesn't have a title yet because I'm terrible at titles, so I depend upon my agent and and the <laughs> publishing house to help. I always I give so many titles like. And, and no titles in all the books that I've ever written have actually, none of my titles have actually been chosen, um, which is fine. I'd rather write 500 pages than come up with a three-word title. I find uh -huh. the, writing the novel much easier. But this next book is about this woman named Constance, who just desperately wants safety and love in her life. And she is dating uh, a man who she is kind of, doesn't really know that well, is kind of unsure of. But when he proposes, she says yes, because she wants to be married and she wants the happily ever after. He gives her an antique engagement ring. And in the process of researching that ring, she discovers that, discovers that the long dead man who created the ring uh, yep. was an American ambulance driver in World War I. And he wrote yep. letters home from the war. And those letters had been compiled into a book. So Constance goes to the library to read those letters and she senses a kindred spirit. And so on a whim, she writes a note to this long dead man um, telling him about her fears about getting married. And she returns to the library to read more letters and discovers that this long deceased man has written her back. And that's wow. the beginning of the story. Wow. Whoa, so, the hair on my neck just kind of stood up there. But... Oh, good. That's yeah. what I want. That's the reaction I want. I just kind of went, uh, 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 so there you go. There you go. Well, it's been wonderful to have you on the show. We really appreciate it, Nan. Uh, give us your dot com so people can find you on the interwebs. Sure. Um, Instagram at Nan Fisher Author, F I S C H E R. And, and my website is Nan Fisher Author dot com. There you go. And thank you very much for coming on. We really appreciate it. You've been a wonderful guest today. Oh, thank you so much. I love your show, and it was really wonderful to be here today. Thank you very much. Uh, so, folks, order up the book. You can pre-order it now wherever fine bookstores are, are uh, wherever fine books are sold at fine bookstores. But don't go to those alleyway bookstores because they're dangerous. You might need a <laughs> tetanus shot if you go into one, or you might get stabbed. So, don't go into the alleyway bookstores. <laughs> Only go to fine bookstores. Order it up. Uh, it's going to be available July 26, twenty twenty two. 
The book is called Some of It Was Real. And it sounds like you're going to really love it, and there's a good spin at the end. So definitely pick it up. Pre-order it now so you can be the first one on your block to take it so you read it. Go to YouTube.com for says Chris Voss. Hit uh, all, everything over there with the bell notification button. Go to Goodreads.com for says Chris Voss. All the different groups we have on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and all those crazy places that the uh, that the show is at. Thanks for tuning in. Be sure to be good to each other, stay safe, and we'll see you guys next time.